reasons and circumstances wherein we give thanks. And I wanted to start this month off with the idea of giving thanks to the Lord. Because there's nowhere else that we can give thanks to. Everything we have comes from God. Everything that we are belong to God. You are not here of your own will. Um, I don't know if you knew that or not. You're not. Um, you showed up on this planet and it wasn't your decision. Um, you just arrived. And unless um, something drastically happens that you lose your head in the moment, you're not leaving of your own accord either. And even if you do try and leave of your own accord, even that God holds in His hand. Um, I've known many who tried to take and end their days on this planet, and they failed to do so because God would not permit it many times. You do not belong to yourself. You belong to God. And if there's ever a place that we need to give thanks, it's to the Lord. I think there are times that we fail to give thanks to the Lord because we fail to look at Him. We don't gaze upon God. We don't stand in awe and wonder and, and look upon the, the, the beauty and the glory of the Lord. We get so wrapped up in seeing ourselves and seeing our circumstances and seeing whatever it is that is around us or maybe even not even around us but just whatever it is in our own heart we look within so often we are prone to naval watching and I don't mean ships at sea you just always looking inward and you never have a chance to look beyond yourself God is beyond you and he's worthy of gazing upon I had hoped that while Patty and I were down on the beach and we were, she, she wouldn't go all the way down with me, that's okay. We were on these rocky crags and yeah, she grimaces at me hopping down there like I'm some kind of weird goat or something. And, and I'm going down these, and see this is growing up as a boy, it brings you a massive flashback, you know. And I was hoping for a, a rain squall to come in. Because I remember the first, and I told Patty this while we were there at the beach, I said the first real spiritual experience that I ever had was on the beach. I was 15. And sitting on the beach at my, near my home, and where we lived was just a stone's throw from the water. I'd walk to the beach all the time. It was where I practically lived. And, and I would sit there on these pieces of driftwood. If you ever noticed going anywhere on the shores of Puget Sound, there's driftwood everywhere. And big trees, white and pale and bleached from the sun and the salt of the sea. And I would sit there and just wait as I watched the sheet of rain get closer and closer. And I would sit there at the age of 15 and the first time I did this, I was 15 years old and I was watching this sheet of water coming towards me. And the early sentinels were there, you know, little drops and bits and pieces and you could feel a little breeze on your face and it was a little chilly and and I just waited because I could still see that ball of water coming. And it was just beautiful and spectacular. And it was a spectacle. It was amazing. And all of a sudden, as, the, as it hit, and I was getting drenched in the squall of the rain, I just realized how much bigger everything is than me. I didn't become a Christian then. I didn't even know to know to become a Christian then. I just knew that there, there had to be a God. And, and so from then on, I always look forward to a walk in the rain. Because <coughs> it touches me. It's just, it just something in me from the days long ago, as I saw this mighty cloud come across the sky. And the sky just draped from one side to the other. The rippling waters of the Puget Sound and just the beauty and the glory and the majesty of that moment has sunk into me. That there has to be a God. Well, I'm so thankful that He revealed Himself to me four years later when I was 19. But there are days that we close our eyes to Him. And today is a day we're going to take and gaze upon God. 
If you are at Psalm 136, congratulations, you found your way there. If you are not there yet, turn to your neighbor. They know how to get there. They can help you. There are four times in this psalm that it is commanded to give thanks. And those are the four things we're going to be looking at today. But I want us to go through this in a, in a chorus of sorts. This was meant to be a psalm where a leader would read the opening line and the congregation of whoever gathered in the temple at the time would respond with the refrain, His love endures forever. Repeat that with me. His love endures, endures forever. So we're going to do this, even as they did it in the days of the temple. I'm going to read the opening, and you will respond with the refrain. You'll get used to it. It's going to seem repetitive. But by the time you get to the end of this psalm, if you don't know that his love endures forever, you're dead. There's got to be something in you to be able to say this over and over again. Let's go to the Lord and pray. We thank you, Lord. Because your love does endure forever. And now, Father, as we have repeated this over and over again, in a great refrain, in a chorus of praise, an acknowledgement of your great love for us, we will never now forget that your love endures forever. May it be, Father, in the brief moments that we have as we touch on these great reasons to give thanks to you, to fill our hearts and open our eyes that we should see and behold the beauty of the Lord who dwells in majesty on high and yet lives in the midst of his people. We are your people in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Give thanks to the Lord. Well, we're going to ask that question. Why should we give thanks to the Lord? Well, the first of the giving thanks passages in this chapter, Psalm 136, is to give thanks to God for His quality. For His quality. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. He is good. Give thanks to the Do you believe that the Lord is good? The, the, the prophet said, I know this, that I will still see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Do you believe that? That you will see God's goodness. What is goodness? I mean, Jesus was asked the question. He says, the fellow comes up to him and says, good teacher. And Jesus stopped him even mid-sentence and he says, why do you call me good? There's only one who is good. And that is God alone. He wasn't challenging this man. He was questioning this man. Do you believe that I'm really God? If you're going to call me a good teacher, and not just good in the sense that you have the capacity to do something that is nice. That is not the goodness here. Yes, it's part of it. It's a small part of it. All of us have a small capacity to do good things. Amen? I mean, there are atheists that are doing good things. There are people who are of false religions that are doing good things. That's not the goodness that he's talking about here. The goodness of, of God is the very essence of his quality. Who he is, is good. Can you believe that God is good in the midst of a circumstance that demands that you believe otherwise? Job Not knowing the great argument between God and Satan is thrust into a circumstance that is inexplicable. You can't comprehend it. It's beyond understanding. It reaches no conclusion at all. 
that God has done something to me and allowed this to happen to me so that what? I don't see the purpose, God. There's no reason for it, God. And Job, over and over and over again, as he's lamenting to his three friends, and his three friends are trying to tell him all the stuff that he's done wrong, and then this young boy, Elihu, shows up, and he's actually got the right answers, and then God speaks. But during the time of torment, he had no understanding as to why God would do this. Can you say, I believe that the Lord is good in the midst of a circumstance in your life when it seems like God is being cruel? How good was it for God to, to kill his own son on a cross? It seems pretty mean. See, God puts us through circumstances and trials and tests and, and, and delivers us through, through the, the burning fires. And we wonder, how could this be good? What value do I gain from this? What, how much better am I because of this? God, I don't see the goodness here. Well, you know, we're coming up to an election cycle. What if everything goes absolutely haywire? And nothing happens that we've been praying for. And the country falls apart. Is God still good? Yes. yes. And give Him thanks. Because He is good. His quality. God is good. His mercy and His love. His patience. And all of the other attributes are expressed to you in the person of Christ. He has given you forgiveness and hope, life, and everlasting joy that will be the crown upon your head. See, God is good. And I could go through and be honest with you, this first point I thought I was just going to hang on all day. I could hang on this one all day. I could hang on each one of these points all day long because there's so much goodness of God. Nahum, the prophet, says this, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in Him. The Lord is good. Paul, thrown into a dungeon, singing hymns of praise to God at midnight. He didn't know the bars were going to open. He didn't know the chains were going to fall off and an earthquake was going to happen. He didn't know any of that. He had no idea what was coming next. All he knew was that he was in a dungeon in the midst of the, the, some of the cruelest people on the planet, the Romans, locked away for his own execution, stretched probably as far as his arms could reach. And he wakes up from whatever unconscious state he was in at midnight. They sang hymns of praise to God in the midst of the greatest strife that they could endure. Because God is good. Even when it seems all circumstances demand that you say otherwise. All you've got to do is keep coming back and gaze upon God. And look at who God is. In all of life, gaze upon the Lord and say, God is good. It said of Jesus in Hebrews, For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. He could see beyond the suffering and the pain and knew that there was something of greater value on the way. Can you see through whatever it is you're going through and see the goodness of God in the midst of it still? We were driving back home um, a couple of days ago. We had gone to see John and Luan. We're driving back up and it was just cloudy, dark, and just dismal cloudy. And, and it was it was. One of those cloudy kind of clouds that just told you it's just not going to be a nice day. And as we're driving along, just a breach in the clouds. And in the midst of the breach in the clouds was this incredible rainbow. Just a small sliver of a rainbow that you could see. And there it was, the promise of God shining through the greatest dismal moment. God says, I've never forgotten. Can you see the rainbow of the clouds? So can you realize and believe that you'll never have a rainbow without them? If there were no gray rainy days, 
there'd be no need for rainbows. See, God shows His goodness all the time. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. That's His quality. Give thanks to the Lord for His supremacy. What's His supremacy? Verse 2. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. The God of gods. The Lord is God and there is no other. All false religions of the world lift up their heads to the clouds and the sky. But there is no God above them. There is no supreme deity watching them and hearing their prayers and receiving their worship. There is only one God. And He is Jehovah. Amen? Amen. We can give thanks to the Lord for His supremacy. How important is it that we understand that we have a God who oversees all of creation? I mean, how many people live in this world today that have no knowledge or acknowledgement of God at all in their life? There is no recognition of a divine being. I was 15 years old and I knew that God was real. I didn't know who He was and I didn't know about salvation, but I knew there was a God and it feared me. It put fear into me and, and it trembled me and it made me rejoice in awe and wonder at the splendor of God's creation. I was, I was terrified that there was a God. And yet I was thrilled that there was a God. That, that it's not just me here. That it's not just one, one life that you get. It's not just you know, 80, 90, 100 laps around the sun. That's all you get. Just 100 laps at the most. Maybe 120 if you're really lucky. And that's all you get. And then the laps are done. The race is over. And you're buried. And you're nothing but you know, compost. A miserable thinking that is. I can't understand atheists, I'll be honest with you. I really don't get them. I can't figure how they can look upon the world around them and say there is no God. I can't fathom that because even when I didn't believe on Jesus Christ, I knew intrinsically, just absolutely in the center of my being, that God is real. If there was no God, there would be nothing at all. Do you believe that? The, the air you breathe, Sight, vision, capacity for, for scent. That you can, you can, you know, you hug on your spouse and you can you, you just smell them and they smell marvelous. You know, I, Patty gets up and she leaves in the morning and, and as she's getting up, getting ready for the shower, I throw my pillow away and I grab hers, you know, because it smells like her. That's, that's a gift. That's God. That's, that's God saying, Michael, I'm so glad you can still smell. I'm like, Dad, you saw the size of the nose you gave me. Of course I can. And we, we, we look at life and we forget there's a God who looks at us. We, do, we close our eyes. Behold the wonder of God. Just the existence of God is a wonder to comprehend. Just His existence. Because, see, if He is really God, He has got to be so far superior to anything we've ever known. He has got to be so far grander than anything we've ever seen. Because you never make anything that is greater than yourself. Did you know that? You never, I, I, every book I've ever written, if you're a painter, every painting you've ever painted, every poem you've ever written, every piece of construction equipment you've ever built or repaired, doesn't matter. You've never made anything greater than yourself because you cannot think greater than yourself. It is impossible to go beyond what you already know. You have to become better, greater, superior, so that you can increase in the ability that you have to create. When I was a young boy writing stories, nothing like the stories that I write today. Why? Because I've gotten better, greater, superior than I was then. God has to be superior to His creation. You, 
Do you ever do this? Just step outside for a moment and stare at the stars. And just think, that one is 16 trillion, trillion, trillion miles away. I can see it. It's right there. Our sun, which illuminates the planet, is 93 million miles away. That's, that's a long... I, I don't drive that far. <laughs> and I would have to drive really fast to get there. 93 million miles. One of the things that when I'm on a boat, I love being on the ferry boats because I get on the deck and I just can feel the earth spinning and flying through the universe. Because I can just sit and imagine it. No, I don't feel it for real. No, I'm not, I'm not losing. Well, I might be losing my mind, but that's a different reason. But, but we're spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. And we're flying through the heavens at 67,000 miles an hour. Around the sun. Do you know the earth has never been in the same place twice? Ever. The earth has never been in the same place twice. Because as we're orbiting the sun... The entire galaxy is moving. And when we get back to where we were, we're never where we started. We're always someplace different. We're always moving. And this galaxy that we're in is in the midst of a plethora of galaxies that can't be counted. God is superior to that. Eventually, I hope to just blow your mind. Because it blows mine. And do you realize they've never gotten to the fabric of life? They have never gotten to the fabric of life, the very essence of why life is. They've gotten down to the cell. And they've gotten down to the atom. And they've gotten down to all of the bits and pieces and they could split the atom. And they've got the protons and the neutrons and the electrons. They can split those and they got stuff on the inside. And they can split the stuff and they can never get to the fundamental foundation of why things are, God can. Because He is superior. Stand in awe of God. The philosopher, and I can't remember his name, who it was that said this, but he was an atheist philosopher, not believing in God. And I think I've shared this story before, and he came into a field of flowers. And he just picked one flower. And on the flower, it had the five petals. And in the five petals, it had the little five stamen. And he looked at the flower, and he just kind of calculated in his brain the, the, the odds of one flower having five petals and five stamen, and it was pretty high odds that it would have something like that. It was really, you know, astronomical. And then he looked, and he saw another flower exactly like the first. And he picked that one. It was like two flowers, both having... Five and five, and then he looked and he saw the field of flowers. And he realized there was a pattern and a design to life. And all of a sudden, it just kind of snapped in his head. You cannot have a design without having what? A designer. A designer. You cannot have a pattern without somebody drawing it. And you realize there is a God who is superior. Stand in awe of God because He is real. Give thanks to the God of gods. All other gods are false. All other gods are empty. There is no, no substance to them. Our God is the God of gods. Well said, said the person to Jesus, the man. You are right in saying that God is one. And there's no other but him. We give thanks to the Lord for he is good as quality and in his supremacy for he is the God of gods. You give thanks to the Lord of lords. You give thanks to him for his authority. He is the Lord of lords. He is the God of gods but He's also the Lord of Lords. He is supreme in all things, but He is also authoritative in everything. He is the Lord of Lords. And this word Lord, it means one who bears authority over everything. 
He is the Lord of all lords. He is the one who has authority over all things. See, our Savior is not a distant God or a supernatural entity dwelling in the heavens and having no involvement with man. He is the Lord of lords, the greatest authority among men who rules over all creation. He interacts with his creation. He dwells, the Bible says, in the midst of his people. He moves among his created beings, having authority and dominion and power and might and the right to do so. God didn't just, and this is where some, some agnostics go, God didn't just set the universe spinning and let it go according to its own pattern and design. Said, okay, here's the earth, spin the top and let it go and watch it cruise through the universe. And I'm just not going to have anything to do with it now. I'm just going to watch it play like when we were kids and we would spin our tops and just watch it dance all over the tabletop, scratching mom's good table. And, and I'm still sorry, mom, it's not my fault it was the top. And, 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 but we had, no, we had no interaction with it. That's not God. But that's what some people think God is. We can give thanks to the Lord of Lords. We can give thanks to Him for His authority in this world. He still takes charge over everything. Yes, even things that we think He has lost control of. Do you think God has lost control of anything? Do you think God is baffled by any circumstance at all? And you might not be able to program your VCR, but God could. He's not baffled by anything. And, he's, and, and it doesn't matter how much people reject or rebel or, or rescind in their own thinking the authority of God. He is still the authority. Even if they walk away from Him, He is still the authority. What does it say in Philippians? Every knee will do what? And every tongue will do what? Yes. That Jesus is what? Lord. To the glory of the Father. That Jesus Christ is Lord. It doesn't matter. You can sit here right now thinking this preacher has lost his mind. I am not going to bow my knee to Jesus. I am not going to bend my will to His. I am not going to surrender my life to this God who, who will save me. It doesn't matter. I don't believe He's going to. I'm just going to live it for myself. I don't need His authority in my life. I don't want His authority in my life. I reject it completely. You go ahead and do that, and you still have got to come under His authority. It doesn't... It's, it's the guy parachuting... No matter how hard he flaps his wings, he is still under the authority of gravity. Right? You're still falling to earth. Gravity still has you. You don't have it. And no matter how far you think you can reject the authority of God, I promise you that God's authority is still intact. He still has dominion over the earth. I will take you to Psalm 2. It's not going to be on the board, but I want to read Psalm 2 for you. It's one of my favorite psalms, and it, it's one that encourages us to really embrace the authority of Christ. Go back to Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire? It says in verse 1. And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. So basically, let's cast off his authority. We're going to break ourselves free from God. Verse 4. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth will be your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be warned. Or be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. 
Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you be destroyed in your way, for His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Somebody send that to our president, will you? You rulers of the earth, be warned. You cannot reject the authority of God and expect that you'll get away with it. You can't do it. It doesn't happen. For a brief season and a time, it may seem like these wicked and evil people rise up against God, against His anointed one, Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. His authority is still intact. The Lord who is enthroned in heaven laughs at that. It's, it's the ant in the ant farm. Trapped. Digging its own tunnel expecting to be able to break free from the glass. It has no authority to do so. Though it may strive against the will of its owner. It doesn't have the power to. We don't have the power to reject the authority of God. We haven't the strength to tell God that He has no right to rule over us. We haven't the, 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 the enormity of presence in our own lives to tell God that, God, we don't need you to be the rightful ruler of our lives. It doesn't work that way. We're the ant in the ant farm. And we are under the complete dominion of God. Now we can either embrace that dominion. It says that we need to kiss the sun. We can embrace that dominion and accept the rule of God in the pleasant, joyful harmony that God wants to have with us. Or we can reject that authority and tell God He has no right or rule in our life and find ourselves still under His dominion, but always fighting against the things of God. Always finding our lives baffled, by God. The one thing atheists find themselves always in a conundrum over is that they can never disprove God. Everything they try, everything they can deny it, but everything they try just continually points back to the fact that God is. But that's going back to a different point. His rule is always. It never ends. For in Christ All the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is head over how much? Every power and authority. He is head over every power and authority, including the President of the United States including the leaders of Russia, including the Prime Minister of Great Britain, including the Prime Minister of Australia, including the, 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 the caliphates of Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and other places like that. He is the head over every authority. Don't think that God has stopped being in charge just because we see things happening that go against what we think God ought to be doing. He is so, I'm going to go back to another point, He's so far superior to us, we don't understand what He has purposed. But we have to trust His authority and give thanks to the Lord of Lords. And then finally, the very last verse of this psalm, verse 26, in the last place where it tells us to give thanks, we give thanks for His majesty. Give thanks to the God of heaven. The God of heaven. He is the God of heaven. Glorious in splendor. And we stand and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and open our eyes to the wonderful Savior we have. He is majestic in glory. Lifted up and exalted. His majesty. That is the great awesomeness of God. We, 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 he is the exalted 
enthroned Savior. He is the great and awesome God. I mean, there's so much that, so much that we can see. And I, I, let's go to Revelation real quick. It's, again, not on your board. I just want to take you there. Go to Revelation with me. I want to take you to Revelation chapter 1. And I want you to, in your heart, and if you feel like you need to physically, please do, but kneel before the majesty of God. Revelation chapter 1, starting with verse 12. Here is the Apostle John writing, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was, like someone, was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John fainted in the presence of God, in his, ma in his majesty, in his majestic bearing, in his very illuminated presence. He is the God of heaven. He is the God of that which is everlasting. What did Jesus say of his Father? He's not the God of the, the dead, but of the living. But he's the God of all things. Which tells me that nobody really dies. All they pass from this world to the next, and where you go is dependent upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. You either pass from here to glory in heaven, or you pass from here to eternal condemnation in hell, but you're going to be alive somewhere. Because God is the God of the living. Here is Jesus standing before John in all his splendor. We go to the Mount of Transfiguration for just a moment. We hike up the side of the peak there with, with James and Peter and John. And we get to that place where Jesus leads them. And we stand there for just a moment. But they're very sleepy it says. And then it says when they were fully awake they saw Jesus in all his glory. With Moses and Elijah standing there beside. I think we're very sleepy, folks. But when they were fully awake, I think we need to be fully awake. When you read the scriptures, do you encounter Jesus? Or do you just find a Bible study? When you see the beauty of the world around us, do you see creation in its splendor and glory to God? Do you hear what it's saying to you? The heavens declare the glory of God. Do you hear the stars and the, and the, and the earth itself crying out the majesty of heaven? Do we open our eyes wide enough to know the glorious God who's created everything? And the Bible says it's really kind of odd, but the Bible says He's created it all for our enjoyment. He's created it all for our enjoyment. Do you go out and just marvel for just a moment? I was on a golf course this summer. Many times. The golf course this summer. But one particular early morning I was down on the golf course. It was probably 6.30 in the morning. And I, was, I was coming up on one of the holes. And, and the sun had just crested into the trees. Not, not above them. Into the trees. It was incredible. And the mist that was rising off this little lake that was on the course. 
was just, just drifting up through the, through the sunlight. And the rays of the sun were coming down onto the golf course, and it was, you just, it was breathtaking. Just breathtaking to stand and see God painting the earth that morning. It was like watching a master artist just unveil his canvas before me. And I stood there gazing upon this beauty that I saw in front of me. My own eyes was right there. I took a picture of it. The camera doesn't do justice to your own eyes. There are sometimes you actually have to see it for yourself. And people can tell you that they have seen the glory of God. It doesn't do it justice until you see it for yourself. I wonder what it must have been like for Peter, James, and John to come down from the mountain and tell the rest of the crew, guess what we just saw? My first thinking, if I were like Andrew, would be like, well, that's not fair. Why did I get to go? Because we want to see that. I hope you want to see that. I hope your eyes are so attenuated to wanting to see God display Himself. We give thanks to the God of heaven, the exalted, uplifted God, the, the wonderful, majestic Savior. Hebrews tells us this. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. And after he had provided purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of what? Of the majesty in heaven. Jesus. Majestic is not a big enough word to fulfill all Jesus is. The languages of all the earth do not have enough descriptors available to give you the right view of God. A full view of God, I should say. You've got to see Him for yourself. We close with this from Revelation chapter 11. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. We give thanks to the Lord for his quality, for his supremacy, for his authority, and for his majesty. And you cannot thank God in the midst of that, begin to ask whether or not you know God at all. Let's stand. We'll close in prayer.